Um, Mr. Prime Minister, before you go, I'd like you to note that if you want to, if you want to be competitive in this new world, you want to make ICOs very legal here, and you want to make Bitcoin your national currency. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, one more thing. Um, you might want to follow Estonia in the e-governance competition. There's a virtual governance thing that's starting to happen. And I think you'll enjoy being a part of that. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Good. Welcome to the new virtual world. Good. Thank you. Uh, on that note, anyway, it's a pleasure to be here uh, yeah, with but you. But I've got to say one more thing. Patty, by the way, I, I met Patty many years ago when he was just starting this thing up. And, uh, and he was very kind in inter introducing me because what he didn't say was he, that he just ripped me in tennis when we were out there. And uh, it, well, it was, it was his home court, but he just tore me apart. Uh, so uh, watch it. He he's very cagey on the tennis court. So is there going to be a rematch? Oh, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You I've heard lost, it. You heard I've it here. I've lost a little weight, <laughs> whole thirty and all that. So I see you're wearing your your uh, Bitcoin tie. Um, we were just talking. It's uh, you know the price has shot up to over seven thousand now. It's been up there um, you know, pretty consistently now for the last week or so. Um, you were one of the first investors, uh, Silicon Valley investors, I'd say, to, um, uh, to go in to Bitcoin in a big way. And you bought Bitcoin at auction in 2014. Uh, when did you start getting interested in cryptocurrency? Well, it was interesting. I, I started getting interested in cryptocurrency way earlier than that. Uh, I, um, I ran into this guy from Korea who was a very wealthy guy, and he, um, he said, well, you know, I have to go to work, but I, I like to play this game uh, lineage, w wonderful, mul massively multiplayer game. And he, then he went on and he said, yeah, half of Korea is actually on this game. And then he said, and for my son's birthday, I bought him a sword. And I said, oh, well, that's great, you know, a sword. He said, yeah, um, but it's, it, and it's $40. And I said, great. I didn't know what he was getting at. And he said, but it's just, picture, it's just a picture on the screen. <laughs> it's not a sword. <laughs> and that was the beginning where I thought, oh, wow. You can buy with real money. You buy virtual goods. And then I started to look around for virtual money buying virtual goods. And there were plenty of games that did that. And then people started to pay real money to get virtual money. And then I, I, I kept thinking, well, there'd be a game that had virtual money, and then it would cross over to another game with virtual money, and there'd be an exchange rate. And, uh, but instead of that, Bitcoin hit the hit. And, uh, and I think that was, was many years before the auction. Um, and I, I bought some, and I bought 40,000 Bitcoin. And uh, the Silk Road, I mean, not Silk Road, the uh, Mt. Gox guys stole it. And, and I thought, well, that's the end of that. You know, oh, I thought we were going to have this really cool virtual currency, but now it's over. And I, uh, and, and I thought, well, that, you know, forget it. Bitcoin is going the way of the buggy whip. And no, it dropped 10% that day. Okay, the biggest exchange of Bitcoin stole all the money, and it only dropped 10%. And I thought, the world needs this thing. There is a real need for it. We have a uh, liquidity crisis in the world. 
you know, if you have a small amount of money, the bank won't even open an account for you because it costs them $200 of regulation just to get, um, just to get that person uh, banked. So we have a huge unbanked population. We have a huge population that wants to trade in illegal goods. Uh, hopefully that ends up being a smaller and smaller portion of the Bitcoin users. But there was a real need, and I thought, wow, this is something very important. It's going to make a big impact on society. And now I look at it and I say, in five years, you heard it here first, in five years you're going to go into a Starbucks and you're going to try to buy a cup of coffee with fiat currency and they will laugh you out of the store. And you think that's going to happen here in the U.S.? Where we're going to We're use... not in the U.S. We're in Lisbon. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Um, you think that's going to happen in... Little in... jet lag? Well, slightly. <laughs> I, I kind of lump the developed world together, uh, for better or for worse, and I, I do consider um, Portugal developed. Um, I, I, I very much look... <laughs> okay, that... There. Maybe I need to spend more time here. <laughs> um, so, I mean, we, we have um, mobile money systems. We have credit cards in, in, in you know, much of the developed world. Um, and, and so do you, do you think cryptocurrency is actually going to have the same impact or as, as a kind of medium of exchange versus just a store of value um, in the developed world versus... The developing world, and we're, we're co-investors get, in a number of emerging markets. Yeah, um, I, uh, I get where you're going together. with this because um, it was interesting. China was able to leapfrog us in the U.S. in uh, creating the internet. Uh, they didn't need the landlines, they didn't need the modems. They went, they jumped straight to the smartphones. Uh, and they were able to grow that economy in an extraordinarily big way. Uh, they were very clever. They had an open government at that time. Now, of course, they've closed it up, and it's the black hole for investment because you, you can put your money in, but you can't get it out. But now you look at the African countries, and you look at Southeast Asia and South America, and they don't have as much of a banking infrastructure. And so they can jump, they can leapfrog all of us and go straight to Bitcoin. And they can, and, and then there are a whole bunch of other things they can do too with this, all these new technologies. They can, they can have dro drones fly all over the place because there's no you know, regulation, there's no, uh, Worry about your neighbor looking at your looking at you when you're skinny dipping or whatever. I think that this is sort of a big opportunity for those uh, developing nations to just jump in. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, and over half of our portfolio. And together, is, we're both investors in M-Pesa, right? In, I mean, in Bitpesa. Bit now now yeah. it's jet lagged. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, yeah, Bitpass is doing great. Um, I have a portfolio company called Unicoin uh, in India that post uh, demonetization there, they um, saw a jump in, in the number of wallets open. Uh, I think anytime you have um, distrust of government or a government um, uh, passing legislation that makes people uneasy about their ability to hold uh, their own capital, uh, you see jump in, in, uh, in Bitcoin usage and, and uh, value. So let, let's go to um, ICOs. Uh, you, uh, just like you are one of the first Valley investors in, in, into, into Bitcoin, uh, you've been a, a big proponent and participator in initial coin offerings. Um, what, what do you think are you know, some of the challenges uh, that exist and the opportunities that exist, especially if we look at it in light of um, the, the, the venture um, industry? So it's, it's really interesting. Um, the cash flows are confusing when you do an ICO, and I think we will come up with better models for ICOs. They might be ICOs and then SCOs uh, because having that ICO and then raising $200 million uh, puts, 
puts a company in a very weird position because they're a developing company. They're just, you know, they might be, you know, girl, a guy, and a dog, and they're just getting going, and the ICO is all they're allowed to raise. And that ICO is, can be a huge amount of money, but the cash flows that they require to get going might be, you know, at most $2 million a year to keep them going when they've got 200 million. And that can really throw everybody off. It's uh, when a vent, you guys are all venture capitalists, you know that if you overfund a company, it falls on its face because people just have too much money and they, they go, oh, wow, well, we, can, we don't need to solve that problem, we can just throw more money at it. Let's hire more people. Let's, let's just put more dollars into you know, Google AdWords. It, it throws off the balance. And, uh, and so I think we can get to a place where we have ICOs that, are, that parallel the need and demand of these startups and make it work better. Uh, these first ones, any, anytime you have the first one, it's always like chaos. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows how it's supposed to work. And, you know, the governments are all kind of trying to figure out how to regulate it. And it's the fun time. Uh, the Wild West. It's the fun Wild West. I, I, yeah. I say it's like the late 90s on steroids. It's so, uh, and, and does it replace all of us as venture capitalists? Yeah, it might down the road. Um, it's because what, what we're, what's happening there is we're getting disintermediated. Um, it's, it's distributed. And, uh, and we have always been the bottleneck, and by having that bottleneck, we're able to get two and 20 from our, L, from our LPs. Um, and, we, and we get to put up that little barrier between us and the various entrepreneurs. Well, now the entrepreneurs can just go out there to the crowd and get the money. Now, in the US, uh, and in a lot of other countries, they try to protect the small investor from themselves. Um, but here the small investor is, ha is creating a revolution and saying, hey, wait, I, I want to participate. I want to be a part of this. And so, so that means that the entrepreneur can go right directly to the money and doesn't have to go through our bottleneck. And, and we were talking a little bit beforehand about the most friendly jurisdictions um, around the world for these coin offerings. And it's actually changed quite a bit you know, over the last six months. Um, and uh, Tezos, which you, you've been very involved in, um, uh, especially of late, um, as uh, an example of a, a, an ICO that um, was formed in Switzerland that was considered a very friendly jurisdiction for a while. And lately, they've run into some governance challenges, and can you talk about some of the learnings from, uh, from that situation and what you see playing out? So, um, so I think that the, um, it, it, the countries of the world are going through a, a transition. All the governments of the world have gone from this, like, we, we control all that we see, everything around our, and it's all geographic, well, those geographic borders are falling. We can, we can go anywhere we want, and we don't have to deal with this government. If we don't like it, we can go to another one. And that means that governments are now in competition with each other for us, for the venture capital, the entrepreneurs, um, the money, the businesses of the world. And they, some of them are recognizing it, and some of them are not. Uh, it's amazing. Switzerland had the, had the, you know, catbird seat. They were totally in control of this whole ICO market. And then they decided to regulate and over-regulate. It's the biggest mistake they could have possibly made because all those entrepreneurs can go somewhere else, and they did. They went to Singapore. Now Singapore is getting kind of a little bit heavy-handed. And so now they're going to other places. Now, on the other hand, Japan jumps up and says, we accept Bitcoin, and we are going to be open to ICOs. 
All of a sudden, a major, what's the third biggest economy in the world, has just stood up and said, this is cool. We're going to come to our country. And Japan needs it, of course, because they got that aging population. The US has been remarkably good here. Uh, they've, they've, they've kept their hands off, and they just say, hey, just as long as they're paying taxes and obeying the securities laws, the US uh, is allowing these ICOs to happen. It is really interesting that Switzerland had this huge opportunity, and they just dumped it. Uh, I can go a little more into Tezos, which you were kind of getting at. Um, Tezos raised $240 million. You know, and they were just getting started. And suddenly they got $240 million. And then it grew. You know, it went up to $480 million. And, uh, and this weird Swiss system made it so that there was the four, the for profit business had to be separated from this nonprofit foundation that would hold all the money. Well, so the, the, the engineers, the people who really matter to this, you know, the development of this coin, are now separated from the money. And so if the money, if, if there is a stirring in the foundation, which there is now, they can't get, they can't get the money they need to develop the product. It's, it's really almost a crime. And I sure hope that the foundation gets their act together because they're, that, that, develop, that team of developers is extraordinary. And they have, the, they have the capability of doing something that we will all benefit from. And so I sure hope that they get their act together and they start uh, doing what they were supposed to do in the first place, which was get the money to the, to the developers and get this thing made. And, and so we're obviously going through growing pains in, in the sector now. Um, we both invested you know, through, through the early internet boom, so this is not unusual to happen in, in a new industry. Um, but it feels like everything's happening faster these days. Um, the velocity of innovation kind of, um, on the funding side as, as well as um, uh, the development side. What, what, what would you predict to be the timeline for all of this to kind of settle out where we have kind of a model around what venture looks like in the future, what ICOs look like in the future, and, and kind of the right amount getting raised and the right governance in place? So, um, so you hit on something really important, and that is now we can all be entrepreneurs. It used to be a small group in the Silicon Valley and a few around Route 128 in Boston. And that was all, that was the whole computer industry, and that was it. And then the internet happened, and we started to be able to uh, communicate with people outside of those, those little hot areas. And then, uh, you know, Hotmail and, and Skype and all of these great communications tools happen. And then now the world's starting to get really well communicated. And then the search engines, Google and Baidu and Bing or whatever, have all made it so that we all are, have access to the same information. So we're all, if we're entrepreneurs, we can all move progress forward. We, we, we look at what's going on out there, and we take the next leap, take a little risk, and we're off to the races, and we've done something, and then it spreads around the world, and then there's a new basis. But it used to be maybe 10,000 people involved in the computer industry, and then it was maybe 100,000. I mean, now, like 3 billion people, maybe 4, 5 billion people are, all have access to these smartphones, all have access to the same information, and they can, they can jump, they can take that next leap and figure out what the, what the next thing will be. Um, and that's why we're accelerating. We ha we're using the creativity of three or four billion people. And ideally, we get all seven billion in there, and I think we're gonna overthrow those bad governments through Facebook and Twitter and whatever, 
so that or, or a decentralized version of Facebook. Or, or, well, both of those things are happening. They're being disintermediate. They're being disintermediated by the ICO business and Bitcoin, and they are being attacked by social media. And uh, and the best governments will rise, and we will all know it. We're all going to know what's the best government to work under. What's the best place to incorporate? What's the best? We're, and we're just, we'll just change. You know, we'll just go, oh, you know, is it Delaware? Oh, no. Is it Tokyo? No. We'll, and, and you just keep moving. You can just move your domicile, and, um, and the governments have to adjust. They're going to have to compete. They're going to have to become much more virtual and much less land-based. I mean, my vision of what happens there is that the geographic borders pretty much fall completely. And the word international leaves our vocabulary and the word global becomes our vocabulary. And then all the governments are all up here in the virtual space because think about this. If you are a, uh, if, if you've got a government, what are you offering? You're offering insurance, pensions, you know, medical insurance, med all those things. Those can all be offered on the blockchain without all the bureaucrats, without all the corruption. Uh, and, and you've got, you know, your pension, your, your pension can be done on Tezos. Your social, your uh, welfare can be done on Bancor. Your, uh, your, uh, and your identity can reside on, you know, if there are three or four of these um, yeah, companies and, that are, and we are doing decentralized identity. We are identity. much more mobile and people can live sort of, I mean, everybody likes having a home, but people can live off Airbnb and just move from place to place. So physically you are not as trapped as you were before. And if you don't like your government, you can actually move to another one. It's really gonna be an exciting time and governments are gonna be freaking out. Well, they already are. And, and we're seeing that. I, I think, you know, what, what I look at what's happening in the world is this backlash against this globalization that's happening, but you can't really stop that movement. Um, you know, it's... it's um, no, you have to compete. Yeah. You have to try. Yeah. Governments didn't used to have to try to satisfy their... Right, and now information is out in the open, even in North Korea, there are kind of airdrops of, of these flash drives that are going in and people are starting to realize what's, what's you know, what the rest of the world um, experiences. So even in some of these economies that, that are the most closed, um, I think we're, we're seeing huge challenges to that. And, and as much as we may take one step back, we'll be taking two steps forward plus in the next yeah. few years. And I think that the, uh, that the, the industries that were affected by the um, internet were, were big industries, communications, information, gaming, uh, and they all grew, but they totally tr were transformed. And, and then now we have the uh, blockchain and Bitcoin, and they could potentially transform the really big industries, healthcare, real estate, government, uh, insurance. Those are the big, big industries. So we're seeing a real sea change, a major sea change uh, that's going to be bigger than anything we ever saw in the internet. So as venture investors, I mean, stay on your toes. This is going to be a really great wild ride. So, so what's the role of the VC in all of this? You know, I, it's interesting. Um, I, I get lots of requests for funding still, but I get just as many requests for me to be an advisor on the ICO board or whatever it is, to be like, to help them with their ICO, because they saw that I was able to be a part of two of the three biggest ICOs in the world. And, and they're, they think, okay, well, that's what that's the guy we need to go with. I think this is one of those um, times where we have to be creative. We have to innovate. 
it's it's an exciting time and uh our and you know when your when your industry is being changed and disintermediated there are two ways to go about it one is you can go um you know fight it and push back and say oh that thing will never work um and and hope that you can hang on for another couple of years before the big wave just comes and wipes you out um or you can be the change you can drive the change you can make those investments that make this change happen and uh, i always prefer to do that i always feel like let's get out in front of it let's see let's let's take the wild ride that's great. Well, thank you very much for this conversation. I really enjoyed it and look forward to continuing the conversation down the road. Good. Thank you. And congratulations on your new fun. New fun.